The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our lecture today. So today we are going to talk a little bit about more about details about Swift, and then we will dive into the iOS framework a little bit more, talking about how to create views, how to uh, navigate through views, and then later on, Philip will show you how to lay out your interfaces in a way that can be displayed on multiple devices in a nice orientation. So how can you design an application that has a good orientation or layout on, a, on an iPad, but as well as on the iPhone without having to create totally new interfaces in this way. Um, so uh, with Swift, you're going to talk a little bit about optionals, which I introduced already like last week, but I will talk about a little bit more in these details. Uh, typecasting and, and inspection, how you can actually check your types and how can you work with that. Um, the guard statement, it's a, it's a fairly new concept which was introduced in Swift, which is quite helpful. And enumerations, uh, as you all probably know. However, in uh, Swift they have, uh, have some more functionality that, you, that enumerations usually do not have. So um, let's get started with the optionals. So uh, as I already said, usually variables in Swift cannot have the value nil. There have to be some kind of value in there. So you have an integer, it always have to be a number. If it's a double, also have to be also a number. And the string can be empty, but it is still a string. So you don't have like a null pointer concept that you've known from other languages. So however, this is, this is not, not very, useful concept when you look at it first, because sometimes you want to have this concept of a null pointer, you, because you want to use this, to, okay, this, this part is empty, it doesn't exist. And you could use that by saying, okay, for an integer it could be zero or any other value, but maybe there are some concepts which doesn't make any sense. So for example, here, in this case, um, we have a structure which is a, a book, it has a name and it has a publication year, and you have, um, we want to create these two Harry Potter versions, and uh, you can use them by initializing them with that. However, if you have a book which is unannounced, for example, will be released and you want to use it in your structure, you have to initialize that with using this initializer. You can say, Rebels of Lion, a publication year, and you have to put in something there because the value does, cannot be exist. And zero doesn't make a lot of sense in this case because zero would mean this book is 2,000 years old, and maybe not. So. So we have to think about how can we use this concept? How can we use this, this nil pointer option, which is fully used to that? And um, so we want to have something like this here. We want to have nil saying, okay, this is not initialized. Uh, the normal, usually every other language, which object-oriented language would support this, but Swift doesn't do that because Swift says, as I said, the variable has to have a value. And for this one there, they introduced the concept of, of optionals. So an additional concept, an additional type to each variable that can be either nil or the certain value. So, first of all, set if you do this string var and you put a nil in there, this will just make a compiler error and say, okay, you cannot do that because the value has at some point. So, Apple introduced this concept of optional by adding this, this question mark at the end of uh, the variable type. So, you can do that for every variable type that's out there, and that basically says, okay, this type of variable you just defined can be either nil or a certain type. So it's basically a, a tuple around this construction. So this allows you to work with these things. So you can actually then do all the null pointer things that you are uh, known from other languages. You can ask for these things. However, if you want to use that variable, if you see that variable, you always have to check if this variable exists, if there's a value in there. For example, in this case, if you would call the string and it's currently set to nil, your application will just crash. Because the, the compiler assumes every time you use it, there's a value in there. I can ask if nil is in there and can work with an if condition with anything, something like this in there. But if I directly would use the variable, the system would say, okay, there's no value in there, I cannot do anything, so it will crash. So, and uh, essentially, when you would use this, the compiler will tell you, okay, you didn't check if there's a value in that optional or not. So it will run a compiler error and say, okay, you cannot use this because you first have to unwrap, that's the term, uh, um, this, this variable to use that. So um, let's take the example uh, from the book here again and say, okay, 
we have the book, we have a name. Books usually have names, but the publication year we are not sure of yet. So how can we unwrap an optional? So how can we actually say we want to have the value inside that optional, not the nil pointer? So the easiest way to use this would be say, okay, we use the, uh, this um, explanation point here at the end at the variable, and this basically force unwraps that value. However, what would happen, could you guess what would happen if, you, if the variable would be nil? Exactly, so crash, basically. So this, this would be possible, and this would not throw an error or something, but it would crash on runtime, because if the variable is nil, uh, maybe you're lucky the value gets never nil, so you can work with that, but in this case, it will uh, create a runtime error and will just die in most of the cases. We will see that at some point you have to force unwrap in some occasions, but usually you should avoid using these things because yeah, you don't want to have, your app should not crash on runtime. Um, you should avoid this. So uh, an easy way to, uh, to unwrap this is doing an if condition. Basically you can ask the variable, are you nil or not? And if not, I can assign you to a constant variable. For example, saying if publication year is uh, unequal to nil, then create a uh, actual year publication by force unwrapping this. Because now you know the system, and then the system knows, okay, I'm in that if condition, which can only be true if the value is not nil, so I can use this, and there will be no message around this. However, this could be also written in a sh much more shorter version without having to use the if condition. You can actually say, in the if statement, you can directly define a variable directly in the if statement. So you don't have to ask for nil, but you can actually say, okay, if that actual year is publication year, what you're actually doing there is question is, okay, is the variable there? If there's a value in the publication year, then the statement would be true and the uh, constant would be assigned to that value. Because a constant, this constant is not an optional, so it can only be, it can only exist if the value inside the publication year exists, so it's not nil. So with this one, you can actually unpack uh, or unwrap an optional quite easily uh, without having to ask before, because you can do it implicitly by just doing the if condition here in this case. Uh, and then you can use it in the if condition. Um, you can also unwrap multiple options. So the typical way how would you do that is like putting a lot of if statements, like and concatenate them and put them together. So you have multiple of these things. But you can also do in, a, uh, in an easier way by just separating these, these if statements by a comma. So what the system will do it will first check the first one, if this is still true or if the let can be created, then it checks the second one, so it's a lazy evaluation. And then you can unpack a lot of conditions at the same time without having to do like 20 if statements in there. And you will get rid of a lot of, a lot of bread notes. So, um, so this is the easy way to do that. Option can also be used for, opt uh, for functions, so you can actually have functions that return an optional, so you can have the typical null returning functions. However, again, if you assign that value to a variable, in this case, you always have to check, you have to do an unwrap of the value itself. So again, you would have to check, do an if statement if the value exists, even if it returns from a function here. You can also create a, a failable initializer. For example, if you would create a, a class that uses a, a network connection or an online connection and you don't have any Cellular connection, you can, you can create this on the spot and this can be used to trigger, okay, check the network cannot be initialized, so I should not be able to initialize the network connection class. So available initializer is also possible. Um, so, and there, there are a lot of like easy ways to step to use optionals. And one of the advantage thing is optional chaining. So for example, let's say we have um, this construction, so we have as a class, it's a person, it has a variable age, and it has a residence, and the residence is another class, so it has an address, and the address has just a couple of strings and a, an apartment number. So these could be the typical setup that you could use in your application. However, uh, in this case, the apartment number can be optional because maybe you don't have a number in your apartment. Uh, residence, maybe you don't know the residence number or you don't know the address. So there, you have a couple of optionals in there. So how to unpack this? So sample, we have, for example, you have a class which is a person and you want to know the, 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 department, uh, the apartment number in this case. So the, the, the typical way would be to do, again, if chaining. So have a lot of if statements, say, 
if the residence, if the person is a residence, so evaluate this statement here. If is this true, I do another if statement and I'm, I'm testing if this, uh, this person has an address. And if the address is existing, then I can ask if the apartment number is there. So, and then I can use it. So I have like three if statements concatenated. However, you can also do it much easier. Could you think about a way how, would, how you could do it in a simpler way? Similar to the one, to the if statement that we saw beforehand, you can actually do it in one call. Just use a comma? Yeah, basically, well, not entirely comma, because they are not really separated, but similar to that. So you could do something like this, so the apartment number. So basically, you, you ask, you take the person, then you take the residence with the question mark, the address, and the apartment number. So what it does, it basically first evaluates if this exists, if this is a value, if this is true, you run into this, the address, this is a value, and then the apartment number is the last call, and you basically do like un unwrapping optionals in a sequence with just one call. So that every, at any, any point in this call, if this one of these values no, the if statement would be false and it would be not be triggered. So with this, you can actually concatenate then in just one call. And again, you save a lot of like code that nobody wants to read. Um, so this is optional, so you will see them a lot. Every time you will use some kind of function that uses network connections, every time you use um, some kind of elements in the UI kit itself, which is uncertain if the object exists or not, you have a lot of functions which return optionals. So you have to deal with them quite, quite often. And every time you, you are uncertain of a certain state or subject, you should use the optional property to make distinction between if the object exists or not. So, um, yeah, this is the, the typical handle, and you will use them quite often. So let's talk a little bit, go further, and talk a little about typecasting, because it's somehow related in this case. So, uh, as I already said, uh, Swift is extremely strong typecast, so you cannot even, you have to even cast between an integer and a double if you want to add them or something like this. But how can you actually do typecasting uh, in a way? So let's say we have, uh, we have a superclass, which is vehicle, and we have car, which is a subclass, and then you have another uh, subclass, which is motorcycle, and you get an array of this function, and you want to have, uh, have a variable which gets you all of the vehicles that you have. How can you actually check the object inside this, this array? Could be any of these things. How could you actually check that? So the simplest way would be, would be uh, for asking this. And this is the, 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 uh, the keyword as. But you have, and with the uh, question mark at the end. So this is again another if statement. So for example, let's say, if the car is a vehicle from type car, then this statement is true. So with the S, sta uh, the S statement, you can actually ask, is this instance of, of the superclass vehicle, is that actually a car or not? This would be only be true if it's a, if it's a car or not. The same way you can also do with a motor motorcycle, and um, so basically you can ask again and have basically the same concept as from optional. So the if statement is only true or the let only has a value inside this thing if it's true and then you can do uh, like an if statement and ask for each of these values. Um, so you can also do force cast. So you can also not ask for, the for are you a certain type of an object but you can also say you should be a car in this place. Um, again, danger here, if it's a motorcycle, it will break because it's a totally different structure, it doesn't know that. Uh, um, but you can actually do that if you're really, really certain this is the type of class and you don't want to ask for this. Sometimes and you have some callbacks from your eye kit, you, you know from which type it is, so you can actually do that. However, again, uh, it's a um, cast which you force if you, yeah, got something wrong, your application will just crash on a runtime error. So you can actually, you should be very, very sure what you're doing in this case because you don't want to crash your application. So um, there are also these, these super class types which you know from other languages, for example, in Objective-C, there's this object type, which is the super class of every uh, uh, class that you create. And these are the, the any and the any object type. And the any type is basically everything. So you can create an array from, uh, from type any, you can put everything in there that you want. Everything that you create, your custom classes, your structures, everything can be from the type any. 
So this al would allow you to create basically an array of any element that you like. Every now you have the, the hard time to figure out, okay, what's the item in there? Every time you call an item, you have to be sure which type it is. So if you ever use the any statement, yeah, use it carefully and wisely because this saves you a lot of code to create like an array which contains several elements, but every time you want to use an object from that array, yeah, your, your if statement to check which class it is gets really, really messy because you cannot really identify which type it is. There are some ways to do that using, um, using um, generalized applications, but however, this is very complex and is usually not that hard. There's another construct, which is uh, any object. And any the difference between any and any object is that any object are just classes. So structures are not included in this one. So this could be used for if you want to have just an array of classes, you want to use that. Um, so this is basically the option. However, most, every time usually most of the people I've seen using any at all, if you use that, they use usually any and not any object. Because since structures are very similar now to, to classes in Swift, you usually don't see, you usually see a lot of people using uh, structures and not objects anymore because they're a little bit smaller from the um, yeah, memory space. Okay, this is um, a little bit about typecasting and it works for every class in the same way. Um, the next point I want to talk about is the guard statement. And the guard statement is basically an inverse if statement. Uh, with a little twist which makes it very usable. So um, usually if you have uh, a function that say happy birthday in this case and you have a lot of like if clauses encapsulated in one thing. So for example, if your birthday is today and if you invited guests it and you have a candle lit it then you can happy birthday to you and so you can have a lot of if statements or a lot of if else conditions in combined together and it's usually pretty hard to read because now What's the scope of, for example, this one? So this if statement has just this scope, and then you have to figure out, and this is hard to read. You should want to have it read it in a, in a more easier way without that many brackets and now that, that indents. So, and the guard, con uh, therefore the guard was introduced by Apple, and it's basically saying, um, guard, you have a condition, and then you don't have the, the what happens if the condition is true, you have just what happens if the condition is not true. So in this case, you say, okay, if guard condition else, inside the bracket, um, you can return or say something else when, when the value is not existing. And after the bracket, you can actually say, assume that condition is true. So with this, and this is basically the same thing as here, but now with the guard statement, you see that it's very much more easier to read. Because now you can say, is my birthday today? If this is not the case, so no one has birthday today. So you can print that out in an easier way. And so you don't have to like have to do this, this, this encapsulation of multiple if st else statements or if and else statements in a way, and so you can read it much faster. And here at the end, you can assume all of these statements that I just make are, are true. So, and um, another thing that is really uh, nice about uh, the guard statement is the scope of the variables. So usually you have. Um, um, an if statement and what happens if you have, for example, if you define that let the x in there, the value only exists or the, the let is only available in that, in that bracket. So every time you leave that bracket, the x doesn't exist anymore because the scope of that variable is just for this, this specific if condition. However, in guard, this is not the case. In guard, you can basically define this variable and assume that afterwards your condition is true. For example, say, uh, let me define that x, and now I can, in the entire function, I can use that uh, constant variable as x. So you can basically can define a lot of um, guard statements or um, constants at the beginning of a class, and then for the rest of the class, assume, okay, they all exist. So in what you will see in, in a lot of Swift applications, for example, you have a function that gets five values, and you need to check some parameters of that value, you see at the, at the beginning some guard statements that, that exclude all of the, the things that you want to avoid. And then for the rest of the code, it's basically assuming okay, all of these conditions are in the right set and I want to use them in the same way. So for example, like this, um, you have the guard statement and you can actually also combine them again in the same way as for, for the if statement. So 
let's say, okay, we have a, a process block, and I want to check if this is a title, if this is a price, and if this is a page. So we have these optionals, and I'm basically unpacking all of these optionals at the beginning of, of the function call. And if one of them is nil, I don't want to use that function at all. I want to say I'm just returning that function. So basically, after this bracket, I know that all of these optionals have a value and I can use them without having to think about, okay, what's the scope of that variable? What's the value of that variable? So then you can actually use them at the beginning. So you will see a lot of functions where, where you have at the beginning basically a gigantic guard block and then you can assume the values that you have. This makes it much more easier to read your code and it, it structures your code in a nice way saying, okay, I want to get rid of all the conditions where I don't want to use that functions and afterward I can use that, fu that function quite easily in a way. Okay, this is guard statement, so think about them as an inverse if statement and you will uh, see them much more often. So um, let's talk a little bit about a different uh, uh, type that we also have. We have, we talked about structures, which talked about classes, but there are also enumerations, which are some kind of type which, which have a, only a limited set of values, for example. Um, you, but there should be also introduced. Does anybody not know what an enumeration is? Okay, good. So I can assume talking about this. So enumerations are basically type fixed objects and you can say, okay, I want to have a compass point north, east, west, south, and I can just define them. And how I can use them is basically using this, this variable and can say, okay, this is from type compass point, so this enumeration, and it should be that best value. And you put it with a dot and uh, West or can actually do this as an initializer. And you can also update them in the same simple way. However, you can also have, um, and usually they are used for, for some kind of like type uh, safety benefits because at some point you say I want to have a certain string um, and the string should be only have a certain values but you cannot basically avoid that using a string because a string could be anything. However, in an um, um, enumeration, you can actually define a as I said already. It could be uh, some specific values to help to narrow down the list, and you don't have anything weird in the string that you don't want to use in this case. Um, so, for example, it could be some, something like this. You have a movie, and you have a name in there, a release year, and a genre. And a genre should be a fixed value because maybe you re-implementing IMDB, and you want to sort them in a way and you want to define that variable. So if you have genre as a string, um, yeah, you cannot avoid this because this would be a valid value, Tom. It's from conceptually, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but the compiler will not say, okay, I'm a string, I don't care. Uh, so you could also define this as a, as a um, genre uh, case in this case and do say, okay, I'm, I'm only allowing these kinds of genres. So I can limit the, the type in there dramatically and say, okay, this should be just uh, this animation thing. So, and you can also say, okay, this, um, to convert this, you can actually say the enumeration should not be only um, a certain type, but it can also be some kind of uh, value type. So you can say this enum should be a string. And you can actually then convert easily from the enum value to that string in a simple way. Or it should be an integer. So basically what the system is doing that, okay, this is value zero, and you can actually then convert it into a different function if you need to. However, for, for easily readability, you can actually just uh, assume these things. So these are very small details about Swift, and um, we actually want to go a little bit more into programming. Um, so what I will do now, I will show you a little bit how you create your first application, how you do uh, multi-view. As I already said, you have a lot of views, and we will start out with a very simple uh, application which, where we just show you how to move from one view into multiple views using buttons or very simple, um, the navigation bar controller, which is one of the most commonly used um, controllers that you see, which you will see in most of the applications. So for this one, I will do a lot of demoing, so we'll sit down. Um, oh, I have one additional slide. So what we want to do is basically you have these multiple views. Let's say this is my, my contact view. For example, I have all the list of people in here, and I want to see, want to click on one object. So we want to look, about, look a little bit into how we can actually switch between different views. How can we move from one view to another, how we can go back, and how you can create like a chain of different views and a of different functions. So with this one I will do a very simple demo. 
Um, and Philip will later on explain you how to fill these things in a nice way with buttons and animations. Um, so let's go into uh, the Segway demo. So uh, this is just a totally new application. So I, I just created it. I created a single view application with no content inside. So currently the code is very, it's nothing there. However, when I start running it, yeah, nothing really happens because yeah, I didn't do anything with that. So as you can see here, as, as Philip explained, uh, showed you later, or yes, last week, let's switch to a different device here. Um, so this is my first view. How to get rid of this again? There, there you go. So this is my start view, and this is what happens if I start the application. Nothing really interesting. So if I want to create a different view, I can just use that by saying, okay, I want to have, oh, I really, uh, view controller, in this case. So this is my second view that I have here. And let's say this should be, for example, the detailed content. So this could be a contact list. If I have a list of people there and I click on, the, on one of these people and I get a detailed view, the address and the phone number. So the typical thing that you see. So one thing how you can actually change from one view to a different view is, um, is by using a button. So let's say put a button in here. And the simplest way to do that is to do a command thing and say uh, present modality. And what happens, I create these little segue. So this is basically the connection between these two different views. And uh, what happens now if I run this again, let's see. So nothing really because the, they have the same color. Let's change the color to make it a little bit more readable or visible what happens. Uh, are you, so let's say this is green and let's keep that white. So you see, okay, this is the way how you can switch between different views. Now you could design your different applications or different parts of your interface in these two different views. So now I have to think about, okay, how do I get back? So the, the easiest way to do that would be to just say, okay, um, I have a button here and I do the same thing. I press control, click and drag it back and say, okay, present this back and you get another connection there. Uh, so that, that you run this now. So I get a button and I get another, get another button. So I can switch between these two views. However, as you can already see, I just created two views and it gets already pretty messy. So think about if you have like 20 views or something like this, the storyboard that you have in this application here will be horrible in a way. And that's some ways how you can get around these things. First of all, you could program that on your own if you want, like to. So you can program the entire thing if you want. Yes? What again? new window. So basically you click on this one here and then you click view controller. You want to have a view controller. So the view controller is basically the part where you create a view and the part, code part. We will go into that also as well. So I can also do that programly. I can say I want to connect these things. However, there's also an easy way, at least for the back button, there's something like the system can unwind the function that you just do. did. And I will do that in code by basically saying, okay, let me um, create a function here. Uh, let's call it IB action. So does anybody remember what the IB action command was for? Yeah, but not only a button. IB action command basically says, okay, this function, I want to make it visible for the storyboard. So the IB, the IB command basically tells the system, okay, I need to have a connection and I will, it will be visible in my uh, storyboard. So I can actually connect something from the storyboard into my code. So this is the way I do that. So this is a function and let's say unwind to make this happen. And I say for, uh, uh, for a segue, yeah, let's call it uh, unwind. Segway, and then I, I give it a UI 
storyboard segue. So this is the, basically the class of this connection that I just created. So that's basically it. So what I now have to do, I have to connect this to that thing. Yeah, the new... This is a little bit messy, but this is the view I want to have. This is hard to see for you. So basically what I have now is... Uh, how to get rid of this one? No, wrong one. Uh, is basically I have... On the one side I have the storyboard here on this side and I have the code, the representing code of the other side. So what I can do is basically I want to connect this uh, to, the, um, to this function. I could drag it inside the code, but I can also drag it to this little tiny object there, which is hard to read. However, now you can see, okay, this is my function. As, uh, you, can you actually see that in at the back? So unfortunately, I cannot make it much better, but it's actually the same name as the function I just called. So this is unwind and then the function call. And what I'm doing here now, I'm connecting this to here. Okay, why does it change? Let's set it to manual. So what I now did, I basically create an unwind thing to don't go back to the, to the previous one, so don't to a specific one, but I can use that to go back from any, any set where I came from. So I can use it as a bug function and can use just one function to have like 20 of these connected together and I'm just calling the unwind thing to go one step back. So it's not, I'm not going back to a specific view, but I'm going back to the last one that I have. So again, doing this one and going back to this one. So I can, every time I create a new um, view, I could just create another button that connects to the same function. So this is just minus one step basically, going these things back. So. Um, however, this is like a little bit tedious. Yes? Uh, how do you define the event? For example, is it when it's fresh or when it's long fresh or when it's, I don't know. Okay, this, we can go into this one as well. Um, I will create another function just, just to show you on it. So let's say I'm creating this thing here. So I control click inside here. And this is again hard to read. So basically what this says, this is the one thing I want to create for this connection. I want to have an action which is basically from the button into the code. But I can also say I want to have an outlet, basically, that allows me to change the label of the button. So this is the other way around, as we explained last week. Outlet is basically the code could change the name of that button. So you have these two connections. Um, then I could say, okay, where should it be addressed? It should be in the view controllers because this is my class where I'm currently in. Then I can give it a name. So let's say button pressed. And then I can define the type of the, of the, of the function that the parameter that I just gives them. For example, I can say any, then I will use it as, but I can also say, okay, this function should be just called by UI button. The good thing about this, now I could use this function to change a variable of that button because I get a link into the button. And then here's the list of basically uh, what I can do with it. So basically you could say, uh, touch on, on, on ups inside. So here I can basically define the behavior when this action should be triggered. So in this case, it's touch up inside. So basically I touch it and, soon, and I'm still inside. When I release the finger, this will be triggered. So when I, for example, touch it, move my finger outside and then release it would be not triggered. But you can basically choose whatever you want. The, the standard one is, is by releasing. So uh, usually on a mouse event, you, you have make a click as soon as you click. Whatever you do afterwards doesn't really matter because you go into a dragging operation or not. However, on touch, it's usually that UI element just reacts when you release your finger because you don't have this, this, this normal state with the mouse. You can hover above an object and see what happens, for example, a tooltip, but on touch, you don't because would you, when you trigger an event, when you just touch it, you couldn't do some hover or something like that. So it's usually a release function. This is the typical thing. And you, can defi you could um, define that in the same way. Okay, uh, let's move on. So uh, let's keep this here for now. So, but usually you want to have like a lot of um, connections together and this is like not the nicest way to do. And uh, actually there's uh, one common controller that you can use for doing these kinds of step navigation. So having like an overview, then a detailed view and maybe then a third detailed view. So you have this, this chain of UI views together. And this is called the navigation controller. And you can add them by using basically a view. Uh, it's called navigation controller. 
this will create a new controller where you can hook in a lot of different controllers. What I will do, I will now transform this, this current setup into a navigation controller by basically selecting the first one here, now it zooms in, um, and saying, okay, edit, no, it's uh, edit, embed into, oh, I've selected the wrong one, navigation controller. Now this setup. So, yeah. This screen is too small to show everything. So what it happens is now um, you have this, this chain of um, view controllers. So this is the basic controller, so it's basically a top bar that you will see in a lot of applications. And can you actually see that? No, you can't. That's the, let me change the color. We need a new projector for this one. So just to make it sure to see, okay, this is just, just a template class. So this view doesn't really exist. It's just a top view here. So in every view that you now connect into this one, you will get this top view here. This is currently not, not correctly connected. I will do that later on, but you will see you have this, this top bar that you've seen from a lot of different applications that you can use here. And uh, what you here see, this, this marker, we didn't explain that, this is basically the hook end point. So this is the first view that is shown when you start your application, and you can actually select that on the side here, on, the, on this side venue here, you can click on, on a certain option, say, okay, I want to start here. So let's change that back to a different color to make it a little bit more visible. Let's take just this one here. So um, let me get rid of this function. And now I can actually say uh, this button, oh, what did I do now, should show me that. And what happens here is it creates the connection here and says, okay, I'm currently in my navigation controller and this button here should trigger this view. And what happens is automatically you cre create another top bar, so the top bar is created for this view, and you get an automatically back button. So I didn't do anything for that, this is automatically created to give, to give this, this back options here. Let me start this here. So you see, I'm starting with this one, and I'm clicking on the button, and I can say using this navigation app. And I can add hundreds of them if I want to. And I am connect them in, this, in the same way. Um, in the same way to get this information to them. I can also change that. For example, there's this, this uh, uh, navigation item. So let me put a title in here and say this is, this is uh, green. And, uh, and this should be, oh, let's say this is blue. And you already see that the back, the back button, let me zoom in, the back button already adapted to the title. So it's not back again, but it's basically saying blue. You can also add um, a typical button in here. You can also say something if you want to have like a search button or something that you can add add buttons into there that is like for maybe create a new contact or search and that list. So there's this whole option of defining that, that thing. Let me uh, put that here. No, this is the wrong one. Uh, new interface is a little bit weird. Yeah, for example, I can use this and um, I can have an item here or I can select a certain uh, um, let's say I want to have an add option or a done option, so you can use the typical applications and they have this, the typical behavior or search options in this way. And so you can add additional uh, functionality. For example, on the plus option, you can also say, okay, this should be a segue in a into a different view. So uh, to show you that it actually works, let's add another view. Uh, this is, again, a typical view, con uh, view controller. I put it here. Uh, come on. Let's make it uh, hello. Make it red. And again, I want to have uh, show this content, and it's automatically integrated into this thing, and it basically allows me to go back again. So button, I press this button, I press the next button, and I go back to these different labels. So you have like some kind of connection between these things. So 
now we have these different views, but now we have to think about uh, how can we get information across these different views. So how could I, for example, if I select Philip in my contact list, how can I tell the next, uh, the next um, view my information? So how can I move content or information from one view into another one? And for this one, we just do a simple uh, demo here. Let's say I'm creating a... Uh, text field in here so I can put in some text here and let's say I'm creating a label label here and what I want to do now is as soon as I press the button I want to have the information from that text view I want to have this in the label so I'm transferring basically a string to a different view um, different view and this can be easily done by um, now you have to write a little bit of code. Basically, first of all, we have to um, connect this label into my view controller. So basically, again, this, this drag operation. Uh, ah, let's do a different way. It's easier without this. So basically, what I want to do, I want to change the name of that class. It's, a, it's a simpler without this. So basically, wanna, I want to have the evaluator, which is in here, should be the name of that class. So uh, uh, of that view. So this has to be no, has to be done in code. And what I can do now is I'm overriding a function that is always that is usually called which where I want to um, um, transform from one view into a different view. This can be used for for doing a custom animation. For example, if you want to say somebody pressed the button, I don't want to have that swipe animation, but something else you could change that. But he, but for now we will just override a function basically that allows me to transfer information. So, so you have to use the override statement here um, and the function is called uh, prepare uh, for segue and any sender. So now this, this function is called as soon as I click the button the segue is executed and um, this function is then called when I start transferring this information. So what I can do now is I get the, uh, the segue, so the connection between these two views as a parameter. The connection has like a, like a starting point and it also has a destination. And these are the different viewports in this case. So and what I want to do, I want to change the label of the, of the destination. So what I can do now is, uh, let's say, Segway, give me the destination of this thing, and then uh, navigation item, um, and this navigation item has a title and it should be saying, um, ah, let's do it. Uh, I'm just putting in the name here to show you that it works and I will later on connect it to the view, uh, to the text view. So this basically allows me to transfer an information and you can also say, okay, the different view has a certain variable and I want to put a value inside that variable, something like that. So, so basically you can call while you're clicking, clicking the step to, to get this in. So in this case, I'm pressing the button and now it says basically hello because I changed the title as soon as I clicked that button. So this is not, 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 comp not uh, transferred directly when I start the application, but as soon as I press the button. Okay. So um, since we have not a lot of time anymore for this one, I will um, do another demo thing to show you how you can actually um, choose between different segways. So for example, let's say I don't want to go through the red one while I have to go through the blue one. Maybe I want to have them at the same time. Or I want to, I want to choose, I have multiple buttons in this, this blue one that allows me to go directly to the red one without going into blue one. So you have like some kind of, not like a sequence, but you have some, they are grouped together. And this can be also easily done. So I, what I will do, I remove these segways and now I have to zoom out a little bit. And uh, get rid of this one and create another button so I can just copy this button here. So um, what I have, I have two buttons. Let's call this one red and this one this one green. So now I have to, to create the connection between these two things. And 
One easy way is to do, instead of like connecting it to just a button, so I don't give the button the, the connection, I will give the, I create a connection between these you directly. So I can click on this, this blue thingy here and drag it over here and say show. And same thing for here. And now I have these, these two segways here. These are the two connections between these things. And the important thing that you have to know is that every object that you create in the story uh, in the storyboard has an identifier. So it's usually not it's usually not set, but you can use it, and you can call uh, any of these things with a certain identifier. So this is the uh, label here. Basically, you can put any string in there you like, and then you can actually call from the code these identifiers. So what you can actually do, you can give an identifier to a button. And you could actually ask the storyboard, okay, give me the button uh, with the certain identifier. You can do that with every component in there, every view, you can give an identifier, basically anything that you like, even animations or um, the um, drag and drop um, gestures that I showed you last week. You can also drag them in, give them an identifier, and call them from your code. So this is basically what we'll do now. So um, let's give that the name green. On this one, and I will call this this red. And now I have to go back to the code to um, create these functions here. And so what I will do, I will just show you it for for the green one here, and I'm creating a function call. Um, let's say switch to uh, green is my function. Switch to green is here, so this is basically called if I press the button. What I can do now, instead of like um, calling, a, um, I have to call a specific function that does this transformation. So in this case, the, the function is called uh, perform, where is it? Perform a uh, segue. Uh, yeah, let's go to this mode. So, and it asks me, the, so the function needs a string, so this is the identifier I want to call, and it needs to have a sender. So basically, the, the, that you can refer to that if you want to go back. However, you don't have to do that in this case. So in this case, uh, uh, I will call it green, and the sender can be nil because I don't want to tell another segue that I, or another um, viewport that I just used this button. So with this function, you can actually then um, def decide on code which segue should be executed. And with this, you can actually have a lot of different stacks to get connected together without having to have this, this sequential hierarchy. You can actually have like groups and all of these things. So we can really create gigantic trees of different viewports and if you look at a lot of big applications which use these things a lot, they have a lot of viewports, basically for everything that you use in a certain way. So this is the first step that, we, that I should want to show you to look into um, the connection between different views. And um, what we're going to do now is to show you a little bit how to arrange um, GUI elements inside one particular view, how to, to make them, um, yeah, that the layout will be in the same way, similar on different devices. For example, I want to show you something on my phone, which is a 6S. It would be on different positions than, for example, on a 10 or on the iPad as well. For this one, uh, Philip will uh, show you a little bit uh, of auto layout magic. So, like we said uh, last week, uh, the different devices have different resolutions, different aspect ratios and stuff like that. So if I would just place a button or a label on this screen, uh, it would not be necessarily at that place, even though I use here these lines that it's centered, uh, if I would show it on a different device. Um, so, and you can already preview that without having to start the whole application with these view as uh, options here. So if I switch here, for example, in the landscape orientation, you see, okay, the label is definitely not, not centered anymore. But auto layout, uh, helps you design user interfaces that adapt to different resolutions, to different aspect ratios. So for example, for this label, um, I have here uh, in the bottom right of the 
interface builder a couple of uh, options. And one of them here is the uh, align tool. And I can select that and I could set up here how the label should behave to uh, in response to different elements, different labels, different views I have, um, or how it behaves in relation to the container. So here, if I just select um, that it is horizontally and vertically aligned in the container, um, I could also set here a value, uh, if it should be 10 points more, 20 points more, whatever. If I don't enter something here, it will stay in the uh, um, center of my container. If I just add those constraints, you can also see I now have here these blue lines that say, okay, these constraints are set. And that's basically everything I need to do to have um, this label stay centered uh, on whatever screen I show that. Uh, so an iPad, uh, iPhone, and in the different orientations. So, um, but that so far uh, only uh, adapts the position. So the size of the, the label um, actually does not change here. Let's make a background so you can see that. So the, the size of that whole label is essentially now determined by what is inside. So if I have here something, you can see it, it jumps back now that it is uh, centered, uh, but the size increased. But I can also set the size of, of my label here. So for example, this um, uh, element here adds new constraints that are then related to sizes and distances. So if I would say here the width of my label should be, uh, not 20 points, let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, set the height to 200 points. And it now is conflicting with another one. I will get to how to resolve conflicts and see them uh, soon. So let's just edit that here. So yeah, that just updates uh, the, the height. And uh, it st uh, still stays in the center. But now the height is set uh, to, um, to 200 points. And you can see all the constraints that are uh, attached to a object also in your inspector here. There's uh, the, the tab for the different sizes. And um, down here, you have all the different constraints that you can edit and uh, determine, well, uh, how do you want to change the values? So for example, if I would, uh, want to have it not uh, 200 points, but 100 points, then I can uh, directly adapt that here. And should the, the interface not match what you set in, um, as your constraints, uh, or you want to update it, uh, there's this button that's currently grayed out here um, that will update the view you have here or that is visualized here in the interface builder to the constraints that are currently set for your, for your UI. So um, for the width, I could do a similar thing, just set uh, the width, but with these elements up here, I can specify how it should behave in relation uh, to, to the screen or the view you're using it in. So if I said here, yeah, it should be 20 points from um, uh, the left side of the screen. Um, you can see that maybe not on the projector, but yeah, it's actually visible. Um, that this is now uh, not a dotted line anymore, but filled out. That means, okay, this, this one is now, uh, will now be set. So and if, if I add this one constraint, um, it is now 20 points from the left. And it's also doing that from the right because uh, there's still the constraint that it should be centered. So if it comes closer to the left edge, it also needs to come closer to the right edge. And that is, uh, adapts as well. Now it has a dynamic uh, width, so to say, um, based on the size of the device that you're using. So. Um, you can see here at the uh, top there is the, um, the status bar. So if I would add another um, label here, let's um, give it also a background that's easier to see. And what I could do, uh, or what you should not do, is put it directly behind the, the status bar. Because, I mean, that uh, would 
uh, not be visible if there's a time and everything showing up there um, that you couldn't read what is in your in your label down there. And um, Interface Builder has this safe area that helps you uh, to adapt for these uh, for the the status bar or other um, changes in the screen size based from. Uh, yeah, navigation controller, for example, you saw that this has a navigation bar there on top, or a tab view uh, that, uh, that has a bar there on the bottom. And so if I color this in or just select that, you can see the whole view covers the whole screen, but the safe area has this area here on top um, excluding from that. So what I could, uh, for example, do if I attach this label and say it should have... Um, yeah, uh, should be at the top uh, of, of my view here, and I add that constraint, um, then it will always be uh, attached to the top of uh, the safe area. And if to, to see more what it, uh, what it is aligned to, if you select here in the inspector the um, constraint, you can also, okay, yep. you can see what the constraint is actually um, yeah, connecting. So here, the first item is the uh, top part of my label, and that should be equal to the top part of the safe area. And I could adjust this here to be whatever, what it should be attached to. So I can um, uh, adjust that here. So now, just to um, show that, if I embed, uh, let's do it here. If I embed this in a navigation controller, you can see that it automatically jumped down um, and is now un uh, underneath the navigation bar. So that is something, uh, if you uh, design your UI in relation to the safe area, that can help you um, react to, to system events that change uh, your UI as well. So, um, as you already saw, we, uh, we already had a uh, warning or a label when you when I added two conflicting constraints and um, so uh, what what could happen there is for example if I say uh, we, we already said that it should be 20 um, points from the left but if I would say okay but it should be 60 points from the right then here you see that we have these red lines so that's essentially a conflict because it cannot be 20 from the left 60 from the right and stay in the center and uh, similar to warnings you have in code, you have this uh, marking system uh, where you have also suggestion from Xcode how to solve uh, this error. So here um, I can essentially select which constraints I want to keep uh, and which ones I want to remove. So for example, if I say, okay, I'm not caring about uh, that it is in the center anymore, um, and I delete that constraint, all my warnings and all my um, errors here are gone because now everything is possible to uh, be set up and laid out based on the constraints that I set. Or if I um, remove or move this around here in my, in my view so that essentially what I have set as constraints does not match anymore what is now shown here. Um, then uh, you see here this bar where it's supposed to be but I also have this um, warning that I uh, um, that tells me, okay, yeah, what options do I have to resolve that? I can update the the frames, essentially what this button down here does, and it would move it back to the um, location where uh, the constraints uh, suppose it should be, or I can update the constraints so the values that I have set here um, to match what is now visible there on the screen, or uh, remove every constraint that is currently in uh, relation to this uh, to this view, and then add new ones. So uh, the difference between those is if it can't uh, uh, here, um, it just tries to adapt the values. So if I said okay, it should be 20 points from the left, and I moved it to be 30 points, it can update that. But um, maybe there uh, are movements here that it can't just adapt to with just adjusting values to existing constraints, then the last one uh, will also add new constraints uh, so that it fits that. And yeah, this is not something that works all the time. Um, essentially, uh, it's hard to, uh, for the system to determine well, what was your intention, especially for 
the uh, relationship then if it's centered or placed how it should be then in uh, on on different screens whether you intended something to be in the top left uh, all the time or um, centered uh, in the um, uh, on a smaller device it's sometimes not that uh, easy to to distinguish so try to set everything uh, as well as you can but there are different uh, options how uh, interface builder can help you with that so and uh, most of them are also listed here uh, for the resolve auto layout issues and um, similar to th those that I uh, showed you um, updating the uh, constraints the values uh, that are that are in there um, can add new ones, or you can select here that should just add uh, um, constraints. So that is often the case if you just set a height uh, for something and it is centered uh, uh, horizontally, but it doesn't know, okay, what is the, the width that I now need to have. Reset to suggested constraints, remove everything and adds new ones, and clear constraints just removes all the uh, constraints that you currently have. So, have I said everything here? Yes. So, now if I um, have multiple labels, uh, well, that's not. so let's uh, add a couple of labels here. Um, not 19 yet. And uh, give it a background so we can see it more easily. And I want to have this one um, centered. And attached to the top. And now I want to have another label that is 20 points underneath that. And so what I could do, um, also let's give it a background. Um, yeah, yeah, auto layout is fun. And um, that should be 20 points from the other label. So I just uh, enter here the 20 points. And these um, constraints are always in relation to the nearest view that it can find or the nearest other uh, element it can find. So if I add 20 here, it will now be in relation to um, the um, uh, this label that we have up here. So that is now 20 um, uh, points underneath it, but it doesn't know where is the um, exposition of this. So what I can uh, do, for example, or to, to show the uh, the other aligning options, if I select both of these here in my alignment, um, the other options are also now possible to select. And now I can set, okay, I want to have them uh, that the horizontal centers um, are the same. And now it jumps down here. So now another label that I want to add. And you can already see this is uh, becoming uh, tedious to, to write because uh, uh, there's a lot you, you're doing um, multiple times. So 20 from the top, and these two should have horizontal centers. And let's just do one more. Adding this here. Oh, that was... And another background. Oh, what can we see? Yeah, I can't read it, whatever. Um, so 20 from the top, and these two should be aligned. So, and now the problem is if I would say, okay, my, my uh, view should or would look better if there are 30 points, I would have to uh, go back there and adapt every one of these distances here uh, individually. So and there is an uh, easier way how to, to combine that. And that is what's called a stack view. So I can select all these options and the last it uh, uh, item we have in here um, and embed that in a stack view. And what that does is combining all these uh, four labels together in one item that I can then uh, place and adapt. So if I combine them here, I now have here my stack view where all the elements are in. And I can uh, control this uh, stack view as I would a, um, uh, another uh, element in my view. So if I say from the 
um, height should be the same, so it's split over the, the whole uh, distance here, and I want to have uh, 10 points from the left, 10 from the right, and now oh, that was. And what else is missing? Uh, it should be attached there to the top. So, what is still missing here? Ah, those are things for inside. So, the stack view um, has a couple of uh, options that I can, can set. So, the first one here is whether the alignment or the order of the uh, elements inside should be um, vertical or horizontal. So, if they are side by side in this way, or um, just stacked. The alignment, similar to the alignment of text in a text view, uh, this is now centered. I could set it to fill that it is um, over the whole. No, that was not well. Um, that it is over the whole width of the stack view, leading um, that it is uh, on on the left side, trailing on the right. But yeah, let's uh, stick with center. Uh, the distribution is how the different elements are spread over the uh, stack view. So if I um, set it to, to fill equally, then it would have uh, all the sizes here have a, the, the same size. And for it proportionally, would look for um, elements if they are wider or have uh, a higher width, that that is constrained and similar to um, well, what it will be adapted now here. Equal spacing uh, puts, uh, doesn't change the height of the, the different elements, but uh, places them uh, in an equal distance from each other. And uh, equal centering looks that the centers of uh, the views are spread uh, equally. That is, uh, so the equal centering is uh, helpful, for example, if you have it in a horizontal stack view and you have um, sort of like a table um, and you want to have each column uh, or, or um, having the header at the, the center of that, but the center at the top, um, the distance between them varies de depending on the length of the header title that you have. Um, so equal centering could help that the distance between each element um, there stays the same. And then we have here the, the spacing, which um, determines the distance uh, or the, the space you have between your elements. So if I would set that to zero, everything here um, would not have a distance and I could change it. Um, so that makes it a lot simpler compared to setting up these um, items one by one and then having to adapt it um, all the time. So what else do we have? So this um, uh, stack view, you can also embed stack views in other stack views. So if you have a, um, a calculator example, as I, I think in the, in the book, um, can help you to set up the, the keyboard for that uh, quite easily. So now, um, other differences. So this was now about the, the placing of objects, um, but you can also uh, add, add more information how it should adapt to different um, uh, devices. So what you can see here, for example, um, is this weird notation that is be behind the iPhone 8. And um, that is, uh, belongs to what are called size classes. And size classes um, group basically the different um, uh, devices into compact or regular width or height. Um, so the iPhone 8 has a, uh, for example, here, oh, let's... Can you all see that? Yeah. The first one here is um, the, the width, um, says uh, now a compact width, and the height is set to regular. While on an iPad, you have uh, both the width and the height regular, and if you, for example, go into a landscape orientation, that both that the width and the height are of the compact size. And you can also um, specify uh, the, your elements based on these size classes. So you see here um, the different plus uh, signs be, beside your, your items. So, um, and if I click that, I can in, in, uh, include a new variation based on a different size class. So, for example, if I would say I want to have a variation for a regular width and regular height device, and there 
the um, spacing should be uh, 40 points, whether that makes sense or not. Um, you can see if I switch over to the um, to the iPad, I have a way uh, I have way more spacing here between my elements, and so um, uh, since I have a split view, um, these are also then um, uh, have a different size class. So this is when I have a tablet in uh, two apps at the uh, same time on an iPad. Um, the size classes there are actually different. So if I um, have this uh, split view, it's a uh, compact with regular height, while the full iPad is regular with regular height, and you can see that the distance switches between them. And that works for uh, a lot of different elements. So if I would say, yeah, in the landscape orientation, I don't have that much space, um, I could select uh, um, this label here, and there's this installed property. And um, I could there say, yeah, if it's a um, compact width, compact height uh, element, then I don't want to have this one installed, this label. So that means if I switch over to the um, landscape orientation, that item there is not shown anymore. Um, but yeah, and you can adapt uh, things to that. So there are a couple more things you can do with the, the constraints and uh, for example, what you already saw, if you go to the um, inspector, uh, you can edit the um, the constant and you, so far we've only worked with, with equal operators, but there's also unequal that it lesser than or more. Um, you have uh, priorities that you can set. So currently they're all set to a thousand, which essentially means, yeah, this needs to be in there, um, but you can also uh, have uh, lower ones. And so if you have conflicting or uh, constraints that yeah, don't work together, these uh, priorities can help which one uh, the, the um, interface builder should follow to adapt the layout. Uh, and the, the multiplier can help if you want to uh, resize basically, or, or for example, on different, um, uh, the size of different views. So if I want to have one of my um, views twice as large as the other one, I can use here the multipl uh, multiplier that then helps to adapt um, this. If this one view uh, increases in, th in size, that the other one basically takes twice that amount of, uh, um, of size in there. And that, uh, yeah, if also for the different screen layouts uh, um, resolutions also in here. So um, other than that, that's so far for the demo. Are there any questions about auto layout that you have from just looking at that? And it is something that takes practice. So uh, you can set uh, or lay out your UI and uh, then you start it and it looks horrible and you have no idea where to start to set it all up that it looks uh, all right. So starting with something simple like this um, can give you an idea and feeling for how it behaves and uh, then you, you basically learn with more complex uh, UIs how, uh, how you need to set it up. But then it is quite powerful and um, you need to do that if you want to develop for this whole range of, of devices. Because they uh, introduce new device uh, aspect ratios now annually, basically. First years it was just one resolution or aspect ratio that you had, so it was um, possible to set it all up in the interface builder and it would look good on, um, on every device. But uh, with the new uh, devices, it's a lot more trickier. And if you have these split views in there, um, even more so. So, uh, yeah, uh, go to the, the um, pool or take your laptop and try it out a little. Um, maybe one of you creates a UI and the other one has to uh, set it up and uh, develop an interface builder and uh, yeah, just practice it with that.
This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.